Hi, Catherine. Welcome to the Radical Therapist Podcast. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate you making the time. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. When I uh, discovered your work, I was like, ah, somebody talking about trauma in a you know very interesting way, a needed way, I think, in, in what has become a very trauma-informed, saturated culture that we have right now. And, and I think you're really doing a nice job of kind of critiquing that. So um, I guess my first question is uh, for you is how, I mean, how has the history of trauma been constructed in Western psychology and culture? And what do you think has been overlooked or emphasized in problematic ways? Um, okay, that's a huge question. Yeah, huge but question. Um, to give you a very, very um, quick overview, I would say that um, something really shifted in our culture w with um, the rise. There, there were three factors in America that made trauma culture um, such a productive and profitable um, field of cultural production is start beginning really in the 80s. But I think the anti-authoritarianism and anti-psychiatry movement uh, that came out of the 60s and 70s um, where self-help sort of rushes in to fill a kind of therapeutic void in American culture, one. Two, um, I think actually the destruction of the American working class that happened throughout the 70s and 80s that created a great deal of um, economic anxiety and worry for the middle class, which was terrified of falling into the working class and then um, having no safety net. Um, so that part of the economic history of it is related to deregulation, speculation with regard to housing, eat food, um, educational institutions that became the order of the day in the 1980s under Reagan. So the fraying of the social safety net and the um, loss of possibility of actually having um, universal single payer health care, which was actually on the table under Nixon. And um, insurance companies were much less um, cued into profit making at that point. Um, they were much more lax in regulating the payment of, of reimbursement of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. And um, then what was my third? Oh, yeah. Um, the explosion of media and media production as a for-profit venture that you know um really became a place where people could build um unthinkably you know profitable careers in um expo in self-exposure and in confession the 24-hour media cycle the deregulation of the broadcast airwaves under um uh, Reagan again, but also all of those things that happen with television moves into social media, like the media creating a kind of intimacy and immediacy with regard to um, celebrity culture. It really begins in the 80s and um, the kind of um, fetishism or exoticization of um, working class life or working class mental illness that takes place along the talk shows that becomes something that actually moves very smoothly into social media and clickbait world. I mean, there was a time when we thought the internet was going to, you know, democratize um, information, but it became like, it evolved into something that um, giant monopolies um, leverage to capture eyeballs and to make you engaged with them in, I think, a completely addictive and addicting way. And we're all victims of it. Um, I So one thing that happened also in the midst of all of this for therapists mm -hmm. is the um, institutionalization of the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistic Manual that all of you have to um, abide by. That thing was not a Bible, a diagnostic Bible before 1980. Um, when I was doing research on this, a lot of um, old 
psychologists and psychoanalysts, they'd have, you know, it was a very thin volume and you basically like throw it away when you got it. But today it's like 500, 800 pages. It makes a lot of money for the press that produces it and for the APA, the American Psychological Association. Um, but the way that it changed happened in 1980 when PTSD was introduced as a diagnosis into that volume. And we think of it as a progressive thing because the anti-war Vietnam veterans and their spokespeople like Robert J. Lifton and the sort of femin second wave feminists who were um, um, advocating for better treatment of victims of sexual abuse um, work together to, to push it through. But the critical part of this history is that, oh my God, I've forgotten his name somewhere, but the um, head guy who was in charge of the DSM reforms was under a lot of pressure from the insurance companies to create a more streamlined diagnostic um, um, system. And there were a lot of psychiatrists who were really unhappy with how dominant the psychoanalysts were in um, you know, um, diagnosis and therapeutic practices. So there was like a perfect storm of things that allowed for PTSD to today have its important place in the DSM. And it was in 1980 that we started, that they started doing this checklist diagnosis. Like, do you have seven of these 10 symptoms? If you have seven of the 10 symptoms, you are nurse, you have narcissistic personality disorder too. Mm -hmm. But if you have five of all these, what are you? Like when you have five of them, you might have, um, something also you don't have narcissistic personality disorder at all um that checklist model became like really good for drug companies and insurers because it, you could say oh i've eliminated seven out of these 10 um well actually then you know i had 10 i had all 10 symptoms of psychotic personality disorder and i've eliminated five of them so um I can get my um, I can get my drugs and I can get my um, therapy renewed or not because if you start losing your symptoms, then the insurance company can say you're cured. Go go away. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. This is not how psychological counseling worked. As you you guys are in the trenches, like I'm looking at this from the outside. I was also, you know, a patient, a client, an analyzant for years. So I'm looking at it from the other side. But when I was reading about this, what really struck me was the way in which it was about de-skilling the therapist. The DSM and PTSD um, diagnoses were all about saying, um, look at, the, you know, please check the boxes. And it undermined any like experience that you might have where you have patients presenting certain symptoms that may not that may fall into the cracks of all of these um, di uh, of all these disorders, but um, I think experienced therapists they you, you all know how to I'm, I'm going to say it right now you all know how to game the system so that your patients and clients can get the most out of um, insurance and the drug companies and the 1980 revision of the DSM three with the checklist was only provisional. But today it's become enshrined like this is a monument to correct um, diagnoses. In fact, Diagnostic Statistic Manual is only about statistics. Hmm. That's what it was for. That's why the psychoanalysts were like, I, we don't want to deal with this. No other field of medicine does a checklist kind of um, diagnostic um, um, a pure checklist diagnostic um, framework. Hmm. It, you might have checklists if you want to um, diagnose someone with a biological or chemical dis disorder, but there's also, there are many other points of diagnosis where there's observation, there's um, statistical mapping onto norms that have to do with imaging. I mean, there's like, you know, there are investigations for chemical presence. The, the problem with psyche is that none of our disorders can actually be mapped out medically, chemically, or biologically perfectly. And they, and DSM and the big pharma, they want that to be the case because they want to make as much money as possible from the volume, from mental disorder, 
And um, I really despair about this because I, you know, you're obviously um, someone who's practiced, who practicing psychotherapy, who's you know, been thinking a lot about this, but like, I'm just thinking about these younger um, mm -hmm. counselors and psychologists, some of them who have reached out to me and they're being trained without any kind of intellectual background at all into any of these bigger issues. And many of them are choosing this career because they've you know, had therapy and things like that. And they think they can make some money because their own lives are so precarious. Mm -hmm. So um, sorry, that was a really, really long answer <laughs> to your question, but I'm in the middle of revising Traumatized. So this is the book that I'm writing on a critique, a critique of trauma culture and the trauma script. So it's kind of right there in my mind. I, I, and I stopped working to do this. So it's <laughs> Good. You're interrupting me in a good way, but you're also kind of catching me in the flow of things. So wonderful, and yeah, and so so traumatized is going to be the title of the new book coming out. Which yeah, with Verso. Can't wait. Okay. Uh, so, in your view, is there a historical parallel to today's trauma culture, and how have past societies dealt with collective suffering differently? Oh. Um... Are there any uh, correlative um, uh, or what's cases? different about how how societies dealt with it collectively in the past compared to what we're doing now? Or um, I okay, so there was a in like religious communities or in pre-modern communities, the meaning of suffering had usually a spiritual um, a sp a spiritual collective a significance that um, you could um, share, but almost in an impersonal way. Like, it, but there was an idea that um, your suffering bound you to the story of your family, the story of your community, the story of your religious community, your ethnic community. And of course, there were a lot of problems with this because it was rather depersonalized sometimes. And you also, we could say displaced, but trauma and trauma culture is so deeply individualized. And I've been reading a lot of the early, um, you know, Bibles on trauma, like Judith Herman's Trauma and Recovery, like every psychotherapist has it, you've all studied it, but you know, there's like so much missing from her case studies because the women she worked with, and this I found out like through later interviews with her, you know, more recent interviews, that she was working in rape clinics in a very blue collar area of Boston, which was primarily Irish Catholic and working class. And I think it's like a huge thing to leave out. She's like a Harvard psychiatrist. She comes in from the professional managerial class, white collar elites, the very top of my stratum. And she's working with these working class women and they are providing the material for this book that you know sets up her career. And I'm not saying like she's purposefully exploiting them. She's part of this culture of radical decontextualization mm -hmm. of trauma. If you look at a lot of the self-help books that women were reading in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and even like Marianne Williamson's A Course in Miracles, she's now a very progressive gem, but um, also like um, The Courage to Heal by Ellen Bass. It's all about um, a kind of, um, decontextualization there are exercises that you do it's like the checklist thing too where you don't actually think about um your social circumstance your family circumstance your economic circumstance and how important that is um for how you're experiencing your suffering and your trauma and i think that decontextualization is one of the biggest problems with our culture in general because that's what that's the bottom of consumerism it's like everything is just you know, radically decontextualized. It's like Tinder and Grindr are all about decontextualizing seduction and um, and desire. And so, in a way, like the therapist and the counselor, I think you know, you know, in Herman's and in really good you know writings on trauma, would say we're trying to restore your story to you. You you you've been unable to tell your story because this traumatic event creates a rupture in your life narrative and then you should be able to weave your story back into um 
the fabric of a continuous narrative. But in um, Judith Herman's Trauma and Recovery, none of the women actually say, and my father was an Irish Catholic working class guy who worked at such and such a factory. And, you know, he lost his job and my mother, you know, had six other children. There's no siblings, there's no home, there's no school, there's no, um, and for women, I think one of the most crippling things about this narrative, which I call the trauma script, which is that your story is restored to you by a therapist, a counselor, or a workbook, or checklist is that um, what it actually prevents you from doing, which I think is one of the most important parts of the particularity of human beings is there's nowhere where you can articulate what that suffering created in you as fantasy, as a fantasy of power or disempowerment. And that your relationship with your psychologist or counselor or psychoanalyst is built up on a kind of power dynamic expectation that Freud called transference. And all of these women who are survivors of rape and sexual abuse, they want to please Judith Herman. They want to please the counselor. They want to tell the story the way that they think the counselor wants to hear, the psychologist wants to hear it. That's the basis of psychodynamic therapy. And it's sort of overcoming that that begins that restores the ability of people to tell their own story. Okay. And that's not there. Yeah. Um, I'm th you got me thinking about a lot of things, but I, I'm going to go with uh, this kind of your main critique. And you argue that trauma culture diverts attention from systemic economic exploitation. And I'm wondering, how do you see uh, and you kind of touched on this, but how the trauma narratives are contributing to this depolitization. Um, well, it's part of that decontextualization yeah. thing, right? And so then um, you, the trauma narrative as it's set out by the trauma culture industry, that call it, is offers a path of recovery that um, leads to, that's always individual. So that if you don't think about your social class, if you don't think about economic deprivation, this is the key that no one wants to touch because most most therapists are liberal, right? You don't want to blame your culture for how, for how this happens. This is why there's so little um, um, research that is done that's published out there. I've, I've looked for it, which um correlates what we would think of instinctively as you know true um economic deprivation and fam intra-family sexual violence um because we don't want to get to the culture of poverty place where we say you know um poor people you know have more sexual abuse in their families but it's quite clear that children suffering from abuse and neglect come from predominantly poor working class families. We want to say, and this was definitely part of the movement in the 70s and 80s, that child can, abuse can happen anywhere. And that was really important for politicians, for media uh, moguls like Oprah Winfrey, for you know even second wave feminists, because then we say it's not just a problem of poor people, like middle class people have this problem. That's why we need these resources. That's why we need um, the Violence Against Women Act. That's why we need CAPTA, the Child Abuse Child Abuse Prevention Act. Um, what it does is it creates like this idea that there is um, there are victims and there are perpetrators. You and um, it's just a question of adjudicating victimization. And as a victim, you if you survive, there's no narrative where you say and my community needs me in some way. What you do is you exceed into this professional managerial class world of publishing and you write a memoir for other literate people to say, I've recovered, but there's no going back home. You know, like you're, it's all about leaving home situation and abandoning the um, working class environment of deprivation that, you know, you may or may not have come from. But the other thing that I think is really important about Oprah's project, because she has this show called The Me You Can't See on Apple TV that I read about a little bit. She collaborates on it with Prince Harry, who comes from, you know, objectively speaking, one of the wealthiest families in the world. 
she is a billionaire many times over but the two of them share a lot of their stories of trauma which i'm not saying doesn't exist you know um harry looks like a very traumatized young man i mean the loss of his mother and the estrangement from his family is certainly not easy to live with but who else was is a prince you know who else lived in windsor castle nobody else and we're supposed to identify with his story of recovery and then there's something else that's really creepy about um the me can't see is that it opens an apple tv with um, a link that you can click to find resources for mental health for your mental health i'm like really do you really want to give apple like you know, I have an iPhone, I'm working on a Mac. I, I don't need to give them any more information about me. They already have. Like, they're just collecting data. They're suck. All of these companies are just like big vacuums sucking data from you. And I can't imagine, like, who is that person who's going to click on those things, go through the checklist, and then um, get recommendations, which are very, very banal recommendations on counseling or apps, mental health apps that they can access. And once again, I just feel like there's so little availability of real mental health treatment. There's so many people who really need therapy, who really need psychological, good psycho, psychological help. And um, what we have instead is this kind of like infotainment about trauma, where we identify with wealthy people and it's supposed to spur us to think about ourselves. There's nothing therapeutic about the me you can't see. I'm sorry, it's it's infotainment, really. Mm -hmm. um, the real work of healing is very hard, as all as we all know, and part of it is about giving up our narcissistic ideas of who we thought we were. And, um, and that doesn't happen with a screen or a nap, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, and you were describing that, and I think everything's going that way seems to be going that way and uh, maybe that leads into my next question about the commodification of suffering and late capitalism and and i'm wondering what are your thoughts about how we can approach trauma healing without falling into the traps of market-driven solutions um i do think it's important that therapists be paid well and mm -hmm. i think that one thing that we could advocate for is more liberal um, um, policies with, with regard to reimbursement of mental health treatment, right? There's, there's that, which is really important. And I think the Biden administration has done some things about how health insurance companies have to allocate a certain amount of money to mental health. And, um, there's been some, um, movement there, but I also think that one of the things that we should do at collectively or in your profession is to remain um, compassionate but skeptical about confessional culture. And that's a very like that's very intense balance to make like I feel like right now in these large organizations I work at a university, everyone is so terrified of liability. And we have more and more student wellness centers and faculty wellness centers and staff wellness centers. I think a lot of that is for the university spending resources to cover its ass in case anyone actually you know, has a breakdown. But um, I think that as responsible people who work in um, large organizations, I think we should, I, I want to be more skeptical or see more skepticism about these like canned human resources um, driven languages of therapy. And, um, you know, I'm old, I've done a lot of my, I've done a lot of this for myself. So maybe I have the privilege of that. But um, I also think that um we should try to strive to be um I, I hate to say this as authentic as possible with each other mm. and in the therapeutic moment and you know in social moments with our friends and not settle for these canned um uh performing you know, shortcuts to compassion performance you know i even like some of my one of my good friends is just ready to like go oh they've got this they've got this and i'm like 
why why are you diagnosing everyone and everything in this way and it's so much part of our culture right now mm -hmm. and it, it blocks actual contact with people i think when you have this like frame to you know this screen to look at them through um i personally uh think that we should be we, we should not enforce this kind of like therapeutic language on people at work. I think that we should honor and respect each other's skills. Um, but I find it very oppressive when I'm told that I have to have um, trauma informed pedagogy or something. You know, our students came back from the pandemic all in different states of isolation. I was in different isolation. I didn't want to have a webinar on how I should be more caring and less hard as a grader. I mean, I, I the, we were given a lot of these training modules and I feel like we're being trained to um, have a very superficial idea of um, what it is to be, you know, with other people. I mean, I, I just lost my parents this summer, both of them in quick succession. I have enormous difficulties with my family. I always have, but um, I don't want people at work to necessarily like treat me differently or pretend that they care. Um, most of my colleagues have been very caring, but um, I, I don't want to be forced to confess anything. I feel like maybe understanding the public private boundary is something that we can demand um, of each other. Um, I, I don't have simple solutions to this, but one of the things that I feel as a scholar, as a researcher is like, I, I wanna be brave and question things. And I feel like right now, just that is so hard. Well, it's just very counterculture, right? Right now, that thing, right? <laughs> Especially when you're, you're t when you, your critique of the trauma informed thing, you know, in, in the therapy world, it's like everywhere. You got to be trauma informed this, trauma informed that, and so, I mean, what do you think that's about? What does it mean if everyone's traumatized? What does it actually mean when that becomes? The I, I still don't. It I, mean, don't it's I don't. Nothing, I don't. It's the empty. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an empty term now. I mean, I do think that they're also like um, respecting the different kinds of trauma that are out there is maybe one thing that we can also think about. But um, um, I can't imagine what it's like to be a therapist now. But um, I do feel like there are different degrees of trauma that we can talk about. Um, one of the things that I, um, I looked at in the book was um, Robert J. Lifton's um, Home from the War which was an account of Vietnam vets and what they went through in um, the Vietnam War. And one thing that, you know, revealed itself to me when I was reading this was one, um, there were actually very, very few vets who were part of this Veterans Against the War Association that um, Lifton worked in. And it was, um, um, there, there was group therapy basically and there were a couple of um psychologists and social workers like him who participated and they these veterans you know talked about their stories talked about what they did but there was an awful kind of lack of responsibility on their part like they would confess to killing a young vietnamese boy and it was all taken at, and it was horrible, you know, confession. And then, but it was all taken as they're going to become healed by, by talking about this. And then they're going to have survived this trauma. And in 1970s America and the anti-war movement, they're going to be converted into prophets. He had a whole thing about the victim, survivor, prophet, um, narrative, which is one really important part of the trauma script. And I was like, some of these people are so broken. One, like, they should just be healed. Like, don't expect them to be prophets. They're not going to be political anti-war heroes. Although, lift, that's your fantasy. That's the ther psych therapist fantasy. And two, you know, he was responsible for killing civilians. And to contextualize that might help him deal with the guilt, but he actually should have guilt about that because there's no American uh, military tribunal that was prosecuting them until Seymour Hirsch went in and did that whole expose about Me Life 4, right? I mean, a number of these vets that um, 
we're really traumatized that lift and talk to we're part of that um um theater of war mm -hmm. and as i went more deeply into this um you know you don't have to be crushed by guilt you killed civilians like you're guilty but you can start to see and you don't have to be a you know prophet of the anti-war in the anti-war movement like i don't think we should make victims and perpetrators um prophets but one of the thing one of the great lessons i learned from going in a deep dive about that was there was from the very top of the american government army a demand for body count so they wanted every division to say how many people they killed every day and so there you know there is this thing where you have this like i'm in the war i'm so i i'm disoriented i i want to revenge my buddy but it actually was a managerial top-down order and this guy who had instituted the body count he thought he was going to be president of the United States. He thought he was going to be promoted to the very highest echelons, West Point grad, general, lived in, you know, had gin and tonics, lived in air conditioning, told everyone, like, I want this much, I want this many um, people killed. And this is how they ran the war. And so you're part of this system that is demanding body count, not even strategic advance, just numbers of Vietnamese killed. Hmm. And at that point, you could say, um, oh, yeah, they were Viet Cong. Like he was 12, but he could have had a bomb, you know, or that old man, he was Viet Cong. He came out of a tunnel. You know, I had to shoot him. And so they were doing all of these kinds of false identifications. And I'm like, you know, um, you, to understand yourself as a system, like you're you're taking orders you are guilty you're responsible like to me that restores an understanding of how so many of us just take orders mm. right i mean we were under pressure from the top down all the time where our, our very livelihoods are threatened if we don't obey our corporate overlords you're in the war your um peers are all obeying body count you're sucked into the system and um, to just understand yourself as having been traumatized and guilty is, and then, you know, in a mode of recovery doesn't provide, I think, the, the bigger picture context that will help, under, that help you understand your plight in relationship to the plight of other people, your guilt in relation. That was what was really striking to me about um, Lifton's thing was that, um there was no question of guilt hmm. and there were a lot of guilty there were a lot of guilt there was a lot of crime that was done that um people confessed to and somehow it's all like uh it's just it's very traumatic for me to have killed you know um unarmed vietnamese people i'm sure it was i'm sure it was but um i think that that's the sort of political analysis that you know me as a leftist i think restores our connectedness to other people like i i don't think it's right that he, you know all these soldiers took orders but i had more compassion for them because i understood like how much pressure they were under and this particular general was incredibly cruel and incredibly abusive so they were being abused by their commanding officers and um it, it was like this system of violence that, it, what you know, um, Lifton calls it like a maelstrom. It's like you're just caught up in all this blood and violence and it's this berserker chaos. But it's a berserker chaos that's put into place by the commanding officer. Right. And sometimes we need like rationality to get us through to that level of analysis we don't need to dwell on the saturation of emotion like the saturate one of the things that i really like find um very constrictive and restrictive and that therapists are supposed to do american therapists i i did a psychoanalysis in france with some guy who really saved my life but that when they if there's a silence like the therapist goes so how does that make you feel it's like don't say anything let the feelings come up you don't need to fill that void and then when you are saturated with feeling, 
you're overwhelmed by this kind of like you're you're, you're back in a kind of um state of unreason that i feel like therapy is supposed to take you out of <laughs> really it's about like restoring our ability to reason i mean sorry that's like no, no. <laughs> not in DS, that's not in the dsm but you know the dsm is not reasonable it's just like a crazy crazy compendium of lists yeah that's not reason yeah well, we, we at the clinic I'm at, we don't use it. So, um, okay. Uh, That's you why you're the radical therapist. That so I don't even know how people would find you. That this is incredible that we've gotten in touch with this because I didn't know that this kind of clinic existed even in Orange County of all places. Yeah, 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 yeah. And which leads me to my next question because you know you do critique. I read uh, Virtue Hoarders, your book. And uh, you do critique the radical, I, I forget what you call it, something radical, like, um, but it's kind of, what, anyway, but you also critique the professional managerial class, which I'm a part of, right? And so, and I, what's that? I'm a part of it too. Yeah, yeah so I, I, I guess I'm wondering, um, and you, you, you mention you do mention that the PMC's role in, in promoting trauma culture, and I, I'm wondering how you envision a political alternative that recenters material co conditions and collective action over individualized trauma. And I'm wondering what you think. Um, the alternative well, I sort of, for us PMCs. Yeah, right? I, I sort of laid it out, but um, I, I do feel like. Um, if we could have sustainable organizations and institutions, I mean, I, I'm going back to this again, that prize like um, reason, reason argument, discussion, um, and um, the abolition of fear and intimidation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be um, a way of organizing around this, the gatekeeping culture that the PMC loves, you know, you're, which always says like, you're not good enough. You haven't read the, you know, you, you don't use the right language. You don't come from the right school. Um, you know, I, I had, I have this very utopic idea of like communitarian collective life where, you know, people trust each other and set goals and reach those goals. And I guess the last time I had a whiff of this and sort of on a mass level in the United States was really in the Bernie Sanders campaign, 2016 and 2020. And you want to talk about trauma. I'm still traumatized by the way that he was ill done by, by um, members of the Democratic Party itself, actually. And I still believe that um, he has an appeal to working class people, universal uh, and the universal plight of working class people that would have been like kryptonite to Trump. I can't tell you how many students I talked to and friends I talked to who had friends who and family, family from like Pennsylvania, Michigan, like the Rust Belt states that, you know, go for it. And they were like, yeah, yeah, they're, you know, my family, they like Trump, but they love Bernie. If Bernie was the candidate, they would vote for Bernie. And I'm like, this because he has a program that people can sign on to that isn't about making um someone feel like they're the wrong identity and that they their suffering doesn't count because they are you know um uh in a red state or something like the demonization of people especially like from um the liberal side and calling everyone who likes trump a fascist a racist that kind of demonization like really works against um i think like the possibilities of solidarity that we need in this country to actually fight against you know big pharma private equity and the corporate takeover of almost every aspect of our lives so I, I'm very, I'm very idealistic about this, and I'm always disappointed because I feel like PMC indoctrination, especially in colleges, where you know I, I am in, I'm a university professor. I've worked in universities my whole life. I, you know, was a graduate student, and I'm kind of trapped in this world. Um, it's the most gatekeeping part of the world there is, and it's so hard to like build trust. Uh, in the workplace or build trust with people who are 
you know, who would be your natural allies. I mean, I have like Marxist colleagues of mine who don't think I'm a Marxist because I, you know, don't, because I don't want to abolish the family. Like you're always never good enough, but uh, how can we overcome this kind of culture of gatekeeping and really um, embark on, you know, collective enterprises? I don't know anymore. I mean, I was, I was a member of Democratic Socialists of America. I sort of reinvigorated the OC chapter here, but it, it, they immediately fell back into, I think after, after we lost like the goal of, of sort of working for Bernie, it just went right back into identity politics. And um, I'm too old for that. Like, I know they've got to, you know, be doing that stuff, but I feel like it just really undermines um, um, solidarity. I don't fetishize or idealize minority communities. I come from one, you know, I know what it's like. It's just as um, class divided and um, immigrants are very conservative. Um, for good and bad reasons. And it's not like this, you know, blue red divide is so clear. And uh, I, I feel like there, there are so many things that are valuable about America. This is a country my parents came to and I don't want to like write off 50, 49.1% of Americans. I won't. Hmm. I mean, people do scare me in their political convictions, you know, who really scares me, like the rich Orange County types who are, su are super MAGA. But um, if you're in Ohio or, you know, they're being like bamboozled by J.D. Vance, he's the one who's talking about NAFTA. Why isn't the Democratic Party talking about NAFTA? Because Bill Clinton passed it, but that really created the deindustrialization that's like collapsed the country. My parents lived in um, suburban New York, and I kept thinking like, what's wrong with this street? It looks so devastated and depressed. And, you know, everything around it was, you know, very expensive um, um, real estate, but all the public spaces look super neglected. And I realized it's Amazon. Amazon is, you know, has destroyed like street commerce or even tax spaces. And um, we've allowed this to happen. And there's so many issues and problems that we have that, we could more effectively address if there were better institutions, better channels of communication with greater trust embedded in them. And I, I guess even though it's such a dark time, I'm still optimistic because I kind of grew up at the tail end of, you know, the mid-century optimism in America where there was actual wealth transfer from the top down and public institutions and public spaces were really highly valued and um, invested in like um, and those kids today who have grown up in like this neoliberal super cruel world I think you know they have the optimism of youth I guess but I have the you know optimism of memory of old age like yeah I think the most beautiful building in my, in my town was the public school how, how is that even possible now we had it had like wpa mosaics everywhere and it was built in the arts and crafts period with you know sort of neo-gothic things so it looked kind of like um you know yale or something like that i mean i didn't know that when i was growing up but i was just like wow you know my school is beautiful i love it and now like my son who went to one of the you know wealthy school went to school in a wealthy school district like had classes in like trailers because there wasn't enough building for um right. uh, you know the, all the growing population and thank you proposition 13 in california and the tax revolt for you know, undermining all of that you know public investment so i don't know i don't know because i um i don't I don't have a plan necessarily, but I have like values that I think we can, I, I, I can defend values that I think that we can put front and center with others like trust and, um, and uh, building trust and, um, and skepticism, mm -hmm. skepticism built on a mutual trust with the value of reason and reasoned argument taking the forefront, and not these irrational watchwords that we have to fetishize and we use as, you know, um, short term uh, shorthand for like i'm a nice person it's like yeah. you're, you you may or may not be a nice person but you don't have to use that word to try to signal to me 
super nice person. Right. And that's, yeah. and, you, and that's, I think it, the path that led me to you too, is because I've been drawn to like more leftist, particularly socialist writers and ideal idealists uh, because of their move to, I know when I'm talking to one because they background like subjectivity, like the, the, like the identity mm. claim stuff. And then they foreground like coalition building and like, how can we come together and like, and have real power uh, or, you know, so. Um, I see. Right. Yeah. But it's not so much, I mean, um, uh, I don't, I'm not, um, I'm not repressed. I can share my personal stories with you, but that's not the foreground. Uh, that's not going to be the basis of our relationship. If I meet you for the first time, um, I, and I'm not going to go into confessional mode or identity politics mode or as a woman of color or something like that. I, I, I would much rather um, find the ideas and values that we share. And I really do believe in a kind of universalism that's, you know, at the very bottom of my socialist convictions. And so how can we build on the values that we share? How do we identify the values that we share? And then, you know, the personal um, confessionals can be brought in right. to bear. But I don't want to leave, I, I don't, I think a lot of millennials, especially and younger people feel like they need to lead with that. And um, I, and and they're quite lost and they're very susceptible. Here's the other thing that I think I wanted to talk a little bit about, which I'm not um, completely like sure of yet because I haven't done all the research on this, but people who are traumatized are highly suggestible. Hmm. And I think that that's one of the things that um, leading questions like, how does this make you feel? Or are you a victim? Like we should, I, I don't want to create more suggestibility in people we we are all very very susceptible right now to certain kinds of narratives but how can we and i try to do this with my students not let them go free for all but provide certain you know sort of guardrails for things and let them come to their own conclusions about things that's the most re rewarding thing i think as a pedagogue and as a therapist probably, but once you overlay like your therapy or practice, like my pedagogy with trauma informed dot, 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 you're actually suggesting things. You're actually suggesting states of mind. You're actually transmitting and imposing a narrative on the other. And that's what's so coercive about this. And in fact, in the book that, in the chapter I was just working on, I was, um citing this 2022 Harvard Crimson article where a bunch of um, Harvard undergrads went back and looked at their college essays and were, you know, they're only two, three years out of it. And they realized that they were all talking about their trauma and they um, called it the trauma sweet spot. The, mm -hmm. You know, they're aware of their own instrumentalization of themselves to get into, you know, the most elite institutions. And I think at that point, like trauma has become an instrument for self-promotion. They were, they felt very alienated from their own stories. And I was like, well, good. You know, we should not permit that to happen. We should make everyone write about something outside of themselves or something like that from the call, or we should have open admissions and not have this spurious like um, evaluation thing. Because even the admissions officers are saying now that when you have a 4% admission rate, um, the decisions are so arbitrary. No. Let me. Okay. Um, I do want to go back to celebrity because um, you write that today, this is quote, today trauma content has become an easy way for celebrities and politicians to brand themselves and more than just celebrities and politicians. Examining how they deploy ideologically framed social media trauma to create pseudo intimacy in the name of digitally mediated mental health discourse can allow us to understand the transformation of the public sphere that has taken place in our post industrial age. And I'm wondering if you could say more about that. Um, so there is um, um, there, there are many examples of how this kind of um, confessional the the confession of trauma to large audiences enhances someone's celebrity star image and um it makes 
her it's usually her more relatable it creates a kind of narrative of depth that you know superficial images of someone um wouldn't necessarily have um the the case that i was thinking about should i go into this it's actually it, i i talk about this in i think in the interview with joshua but the case that i thought was most striking that made me think about this a lot for the younger generation because oprah you know oprah's um we we'll, we'll talk about the case of oprah oprah confessed on national television to having been sexually abused in 1984. she was just getting her show syndicated and there were a lot of competitors in the daytime talk show space for her. Um, Phil Donahue was one of her big competitors. Later on, the more um, um, the more trashy ones like Geraldo Rivera and Arsenio Hall. They all had. There were all these different other. You know, there were other talk shows in that space. But when she went out, when she went forward to speak about having been sexually assaulted as a child she immediately gained so much um capital cultural capital by um that confession and she said within it that she hoped and this is 1984 ronald the aids epidemic is raging ronald reagan won't say the word aids ronald reagan won't say the word homosexual right but she says i'm coming out of the closet as a survivor and I hope that my story will empower other people. So she takes the language of gay liberation and the language of childhood sexual abuse, and she uses it to talk about herself in this very confessional way. She's very measured. She's extremely eloquent and controlled. And I think at that moment, she changes the game for celebrity confessionals. She elevates herself to a different level from her competitors um and you know in many ways like she changes the culture the public culture of what is permissible to say because the um in you know in television as a kind of public domain right i mean it's not the perfect public sphere but it was very you know it was the kind of earth-shattering moment because um a couple of things were happening in the 70s and 80s. There were a lot of made-for-TV movies that were dealing with serious issues. So she wasn't actually taking a huge risk because um, Judith Herman's book had come out already, Trauma and Recovery, which was all about sexual violence. And there was actually a Ted Danson made-for-TV movie called Something About Amelia, which was about um, incest in the family. It was like crazy... Um, crazy highbrow glenn close was in it and the upshot of it was that there's such a good therapist that the father doesn't go to jail they all like the family goes to counseling glenn close doesn't even divorce the ted danson they're, they're sort of all reconciled and in some ways like the the space for it was already paved for her made safe but she using the word i was like that was incredible that was an incredible mediatic moment and I think it created a kind of um, a language of a celebrity confessionals that then she and Prince Harry, you know, really um, leveraged with Apple TV because um, Lady Gaga goes on um, something, the me you don't see and talks about having been sexually assaulted in the music industry. Glenn Close goes on and talks about the history of mental illness in her family and how this affected her career and then there are a number of like less famous people or there's there are a couple of them athletes um, who also go out there and talk about mental illness and so the we're able to talk about mental illness openly but it's very different when celebrities talk about this and use their you know um channels of communication to grow their audience and apple tv encourages this to make more eyeballs fall on apple tv then when we um translate this into our private you know lives and i think unfortunately for younger people who live in a much more emulative you know relationship to uh, media they believe that that permitted them to you know suddenly be able to um leverage their own traumas for attention and I think that just promotes a certain kind of narcissism and blockage 
that um, then, you know, blocks actual intersubjectivity, relationality. I keep coming back to this. Like, the, I want people to have better relationships with each other that are not mediated by screen media and celebrity culture. And um, I think that this just draws us more deeply into it. So the, the thing that I was going to say about, like, mental illness in the public sphere in America was that um, I think it was um, George McGovern in 1972 picked Thomas Eagleton, a senator from Missouri, as his running mate. And it turned out that they hadn't vetted him properly, you know, whatever that means. And um, Eagleton had had periods of like deep, deep depression, and he had had electroshock therapy. And this came out and the Republican, like Nixon was going to lose, but you know, they made hay on this, like, oh my God, he's crazy. And then, um, McGovern backtracked and dropped him from the ticket so it showed that he was like waffling and he couldn't make his decisions. But like there was such a stigma for being um, a public person with mental illness. So yes, this, you know, mental illness and its acceptance, you know, um, does change, you know, the public, what's permissible to say in the public and public world and what's permissible to, um, um have experience confessed to in the public world like i i think i think i'm not sure but if eagleton were to be running today like we would be a culture that was more tolerant of histories of mental illness so i'm not actually 100 percent sure but um um that at least is the message that um oprah winfrey set out was that this is progress. Like my confession is progress, but it's like, is it progress or is it the illusion of progress? Because 1984 is also a period of great conservatism of reaction. She doesn't say the word AIDS or gay, you know, in her public confession, she uses the terms, she signals to them. And then like, um, our, is child abuse and you know violence against children actually mitigated by her public confession does our social welfare system change because of that i feel like los angeles county is a great example of like the um home of uh hollywood and you know child services and child welfare is so woefully underfunded and understaffed here like i don't know that there's actually been any progress especially for poor people, working class people in terms of actual prevention of child abuse and because of celebrity confessions. I just don't think there is um, a correlation there. Yeah, but it does it does speak to your critique of the co commodification of it. And I'm thinking when you're describing that, I'm thinking I I just saw multiple TikToks or real. I'm not on TikTok, but reels where somebody is going through like a breakup or something and they're filming themselves like crying in their car for audience right or to build an audience or build the brand or you know um yeah, yeah. and so yeah mm -hmm. but, but do the real does it do anything for real services does it you know also everybody has an understanding of mental health issues now but are therapists being paid any better right no and so you know are insurance are insurance companies willing to reimburse for no. more sessions? <laughs> um, there's a lot of display of emotion um, that was not necessarily permissible like 50 years ago in right. the media. But our you know is our like public health infrastructure better, more robust? I don't think what do you, so. What do you think about therapist organizing? What are your thoughts? <laughs> I think that would be amazing against insurance companies or against uh, yeah in general like even against you know departments of mental health right or I think that would be amazing. I what, think therapists have a skill set that um, they don't know they have like really experience it. And this was the amazing thing about um, the book of woe, the making of the DSM three Gary Greenberg's book is that you can just tell he's such an experienced therapist. Mm. And he's just like, after all of these years of therapy, I'm going to write this book about DSM three. And he, the case histories that he discusses are so fantastic. And um, 
like really refreshing. And so I feel like if there was more forums for therapists to talk about their experience and what it's like to work as a therapist, because I'm really interested in work as a devalued and work experience as a kind of devalued set of experiences in, under late capitalism, I, you know, I, I think if organizing lets therapists talk about what mental health really is today, what mental illness um, is constituted by what their patients need, that would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, that would be a, a really vital piece of all of this. And it's not a piece that I can fill in because I haven't worked um, for decades in this field, but um, I really, really appreciate uh, good case studies like that. Hmm. And that was what was so frustrating about a lot of these feminist case studies is that I feel like they were used, using their client stories actually to um, just confirm their own arguments and not really talking about like what this person needed to get out of the situation they were in. Hmm. And um, that, and, and sometimes you can't even do advocacy. Sometimes you can just tell the story which is something still really precious right, because right. you guys hear stories that, you know, most of us will never hear. Mm-hmm. And um, that is a very, very valuable repository of human experience and healing. Yeah. Well, okay, I don't hear about any more celebrity suffering. I want to hear about ordinary <laughs> suffering and the experience of people who work with people who are suffering. Same. No more celebrity questions. Yeah. No, <laughs> done, done. Okay, two more questions. Uh, first, how might educators, therapists, social workers shift away from trauma-informed frameworks while still addressing the real suffering of people? That's such a good question. Um, I think that we've become better. We are very bad listeners to each other. Mm-hmm. And I think that, and so once again, I'm going to have this like very abstract un- or disorganized thing. Maybe we can organize to be better listeners when therapists organize. But um, I try to be, I try to be a good listener. Yeah. And as I said before, not overlay a narrative of some kind of like hokey HR pre like canned narrative of suffering. And um, people, people do open up to me. Part of this book has allowed people to open up to me. And I've heard stories about a residents and doctors in training and how constricted they feel by all the requirements of medical school and how compa- how burnt out they feel as residents. I've, you know, heard stories about young women in academia who, you know, had to confront, um, older men still who are preying upon them, but they don't want to become, you know, the center of a, another lawsuit. So how do you negotiate that choice? And, you know, um, people who are working class, who are reading my book, who didn't go to college, who are obviously like damaged by the whole gatekeeping thing and who don't feel like they have the authority to speak about the issues that they want to talk about. Like, I feel like, I want to listen to all these stories, you know, um, one of the, um, one of the earliest people who got in touch with me, who was like, I can't, you know, expose my name, you know, I'll be canceled here forever. No one will work with me was a union organizer in New Zealand who was dealing with Jacinta Ardern's, you know, she was prime minister during COVID and she was like, you know, New Zealand is actually a very poor country. It's very like working class in many ways. And she's like, there are all of these programs about indigenous people and the Maori, but you know, um, re- labor organizing here is so difficult. And I see all my colleagues speaking this false language, and um, you know, we're just betraying the uh, the people, the, the workers that we're supposed to represent. Please don't tell anyone that um, I've emailed you. You know, and there's like so much fear of criticizing um, uh, management. And, you know, what that threat of losing one's livelihood is. And that's so much like what I have compassion for in this 
in everything that I'm writing is that how do we organize or in, you know really listen to each other in an authentically empowering way as a way of responding to the threat of the boss, the threat of human resources, the threat of the powers that could deprive us of our livelihoods. I mean, I grew up in a very abusive family, so I know that fear. And I try to honor it without laying over like, oh yeah, you're traumatized. Here, let me tell you how you recover from this. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. I I I I feel like a really good um uh listen a uh, really good the really good skills of listening i don't know how to um standardize that and to disseminate it but um it's really uh something we lack now as a culture and as for a sure. society for sure i actually have an extra question um you just kind of brought it up for me i'm wondering you know you do write about how we're getting up really good at doing all sorts of analysis but we not so much the class analysis so I'm wondering, you know, especially when it comes to trauma, I'm wondering, like, how do we, the PMC, those of us in the PMC, how do we be class traders or like, what do, what is it that we do to like, kind of disrupt that a little bit? You know, um, one of the things that I, I'm focusing on is what um, the rest of the PMC finds too um, mundane or banal, like um, bread and butter issues humdrum issues, the questions of work, the question of um, um, feeding your family, putting a roof over your head, like making sure that people have the material conditions for stability and not these like crazy fanciful identity issues that, you know, are about me policing other people, um, health care, um, just very basic like sus life sustaining issues, I think should always be our focus. And it's not the focus of the professionals, they, and especially liberals. And this is why Trump has this weird appeal. Like, you think like, why, why do so many people like this guy who's like so incoherent and crazy and, uh, uh, and litigious? Like there's something even affectually like about him that people see as cathartic. And, you know, his like anger and his desperation for attention. There's something about the PMC de Dem Democratic um, candidates that are all about control and repression. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, you know, of course, it's like, in a, he's like inappropriate all the time and all, everything else, but he, he does speak to like people's discontentment. I heard friends in um, Pennsylvania, you know, big swing states say that all the Trump flyers are about um, cost of living. Mm -hmm. So he's just trying to like hammer away at um, material issues. Yeah, working class. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and why, why, why isn't the left doing that? You know, why isn't the left just associating everything that we're doing abroad, financing Israel and the war in Palestine, with you know the hollowing out of public infrastructure at home like keep making those associations um a lot of um my more radical colleagues that i was talking about before they find like this kind of concern too um boring they literally will say it's boring it's like that's a social democracy you know that doesn't work i'm like if we had social democracy it would just be great at this point instead of this um you know doggy dog world that we're in right now like, let's have social democracy and then move to communism. I don't know, but let's like get to, let's get to single payer health. Let's get to the dissolution of private equity. Yeah, yeah. And step one, like maybe prevent private equity from taking over hospitals. Yeah. Like, that's so boring to people, but what we can do is actually focus on bread and butter issues and concerns of working people, ordinary people and honor that. And that's like the most class traitor traitorous thing we could do at this point. Which is f funny. I was listening to a couple of people have a conversation about Frederick Jameson, who recently passed away, right? And and one of them said ultimately that like Jameson's work had him thinking that normality leads to emancipation. And um, I was thinking about what you were saying, like you know, nobody wants to do the boring stuff or the normal stuff. Like let's just help people make a living or something like that, or like have food and housing and 
but that's boring. But you know that normality leads to em emancipation. I don't. But they they make this kind of like uh, the you know the government has made everything seem so, and I think the liberal government is so bureaucratic and technocratic. So it's like you just feel defeated before you even start. But um, if you have your goals very clear, and they're usually corporate interests that are making issues seem so complicated that we can't solve them like oh like single payer that's you know just impossible it's so you know american healthcare will never work that way we can't it's so fragmented i i feel like every time you think that something is so boring you have to ask yourself like why does this feel so boring who who wants me to feel like this is so boring i'm just not going to pay attention to it exactly um I mean, well, I know that sounds like a conspiracy theory, <laughs> but I, I really do believe that there's a kind of demobilization that takes place around these um, mundane bread and butter issues. And then there's a lot of, we get a lot of rewards for um, taking up the more sensationalistic issues. And I guess that's one of the things about trauma is that it leaves itself, it leaves it, this very reified notion of trauma leaves itself very open to sensationalization. And people were saying this about trauma culture, like through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, nobody was listening to them. Like there were women in the women's movement who were criticizing Judith Herman. Um, there were um, historians of social work who were criticizing the, feti the sort of decontextualization of child abuse. Well, we won't know their names because they don't get the media attention that um the more spectacular versions of this kind of suffering got so great all right last question uh that i like to ask all my guests and that's what books thinkers films what's inspiring you these days what's capturing your attention oh, right on my um she's been i've been reading this one for a long time eva Oluse, she's a sociologist um and this book cold intimacies the making of emotional capitalism is um cold intimacies. something that i keep going back to cold intimacies and um um uh, i'm watching babylon berlin about 1920s and 30s germany and mm -hmm. it is so incredible and there's a whole section in there about hypnosis and fascism and uh, it's it's not doesn't go for realism it goes for like visual impact but it's like a beautifully constructed story about you know germany between the wars right as nazism is um um rising and i read this recently and i think that it might be interesting to some of your listeners if they're therapists um ethan waters crazy like us oh, yeah. the globalization of american psyche I don't know if you know this, but I do. Yeah, I, I, I really, have it. Yeah, I, uh, listeners, if you haven't read Crazy Like Us, get it. Yep. And awesome. I'm reading a Haitian writer. Yeah, I'm reading a Haitian writer right now. It's very, very tough read. Um, my Claude, my Claude Chauvet, um, Love, Anger, Madness, and uh, I, I, I'm not. It is not for the uh, weak of heart. Um, it's about. It's based on, you know, the rise of um, Papa Duc Duvalier. So it's pretty. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, thank you for that. And Catherine, thank you for the time and sharing with us. And good luck with the book. And I hope to get you back after it's out so we can promote it. Oh, thanks so much. And, you know, we're in the same corner of the woods. So maybe we can meet in real life, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. next time. Let's do it in person. <laughs> okay. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Bye, Chris.